Morning Church. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is the word of the Lord. Our teaching text comes from a letter. It's called 1 John or 1 John, however you choose. Let me show you uh, two slides. I think it's important for us just to uh, start from what are we dealing with here. So we're dealing with a human being called John, writing to people in the church. So he was John, either the beloved disciple or a John known as the elder, and he was overseeing house churches in the area in Ephesus. So he wrote a letter to human beings like you in the church. Second slide, please. This is important if you read the book of 1 John. It's got two massive sections, and both of these sections start with the words, this is the message. So the first big section says, this is the message, and here it is, God is light. That's the first part of 1 John, and that's where our teaching text comes from. What's important for you to see is that John starts in the first four verses by saying the following. We have fellowship. Do you see it? Don't just tell me our church has a cool name. Our church has a biblical name. We have fellowship. The Greek word koinonia. We have something in common. Thanks, Kuliso, for that criteria you mentioned. And what is that? That is that we are invited into participation in God's own life and love. I think the picture helps us. Do you see the circle? And do you see the movement in the circle? So you've got God the Father, God the Son, we the apostles, and you the church, everyone in marvelous fellowship with one another. That's how John starts his letter. I think a helpful illustration for us is a dinner table. Think about sitting around a dinner table. What happens when you sit around a dinner table? Check this. You know other people because they they share something with you. You are known because you share something of yourself. And all of you are having your needs met because you have hunger. And that need gets met by the food. So eating at the table. John says that we eat at the table together with God. Obviously God is a trinity, but he mentions God the Father and God the Son and us all at the same table. Do we know that this is available to us as Christians? I think that's a really important question. Think of conversations about faith. Oftentimes when we say share your faith or have conversations about faith, we make the mistake to think that it's all about propositions and arguments. Conversations about your faith is an invitation to a real experience. That's it. And a conversation about your faith is an invitation to a real experience that is an amazing and life-transforming fellowship with God Himself. You can have that. We can have that. And how do we have that? Well, we walk in the light. So our leading question for today is, how do we walk in the light? Three simple answers. There you go. Just going to give you the road map. We walk in the light with a clear conscience, verse 6, in community and trusting in the gospel. Rudolf, that's the blue slide that has my points on it. Okay. Well, there you go. Memorize it now. I'm going to say it again. How do we walk in the light? With a clear conscience, in community, trusting in the gospel. Let me show you why we need to talk about this. The words of Jesus. Luke 12, verse 1 to 3. Is that there, Rudolf? Ah, there we go. Meanwhile, this is Luke writing, a crowd of many thousands came together so that they were trampling on one another. He began to say this to the disciples, Be on your guard. 
against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Pretense. Play acting. Pretending that you're something that you're not. Be on guard against it. There's nothing covered that won't be uncovered. Nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. Uh, uh, oh, and, uh, sorry, next uh, sentence. And what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. That means that you and I need this exhortation to walk in the light badly. Do you have anything covered? Do you have anything hidden? Have you said anything in the dark? Have you whispered in ears in private rooms? Because if you have, you're walking in the dark. And you need to walk in the light. Let's pray before we jump in. Lord Jesus, we, we take your word seriously. We believe that it speaks to us. And not only do we believe that it speaks to us, we believe that it cuts to the deepest place between soul and spirit in the marrow of our being. We open up ourselves now for you to do this divine surgery inside of us so that we can be healthy, so that we can be whole, so that we can grow into your image, so that we can become who you want us to be. Lord Jesus, we long for something deeper every single day. And I pray now that we would experience your word in a deeper way, that we would see you in a deeper way, that we would allow you to work in us in a deeper way, and that we would walk in faith, in light, in a deeper way. Have your way in us, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, and move among us. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, so how do we walk in the light? With a clear conscience. Now, remember, the writer, John, has an audience. Okay? And this audience had different groups of people in it. I'm going to mention two. We'll circle back to them later. And then one important one. So there were people from a Jewish background. Those people were all on board with God, but they found it hard to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Right? So Old Testament God, awesome. Jesus the Messiah, not too sure. Can't we just move him to the side and talk about God? That'll be better. Then we don't have to argue. Then you had people from a Greek background in that same church saying that Jesus can't be God himself, right? Because he died. You're telling me that he's alive, but pff, I mean, there's no story like that. There's also never been a story like that. So we can't believe that he's alive because firstly, a God won't die. And secondly, if a God is alive now, then he should probably reign. So where is he, right? So they also said, can't we just move Jesus to the side and talk about God? So we'll talk about the Jewish and the Greek people a little bit later. Here's a biggie. There were people in church to John wrote, that had a Gnostic religion, right? Gnostic means knowing or having knowledge. And these were people who said, look, listen, you need to know in here the logos. It's a Greek word for the word, for the truth, for this revelation. It all happens in, a, in the mind. And what happens after that uh, doesn't matter that much at all. Body and soul separated really i mean soul is trapped in body now but at some point they will separate so what you do with your body doesn't really matter you just need to believe the right things and now john says that cannot be john tells his readers that uh, not only mere, he tells his readers not only to see that god is light but also to live in the light okay so John counters those who claim union with God while really living in the darkness. That's verse 6. And he demonstrates the effect of living in the light, which is verse 7. Right? So John is speaking truth to people who claim union with God, but they live in darkness. I need to ask you, is this you? Is this you? Because if it is, you need to repent. And if this is you and you're thinking about lying, you can't lie about it because verse 7 says that you can clearly see if someone is in the light or not. You simply cannot hide it. Now John disproves this false argument that it is possible to be true to God while living in sin 
by reminding his audience, firstly, of the divine character of God itself, right? Do you see it? So, because of God's character, if I live in union with Him, I live in a certain way. So, if you are claiming to be true to God, but you live in sin, then that's not the God that you, John is talking about, right? So, that's an idol. It's a God you've made up. It's a false God. A God who does what you want Him to do is not a real God, okay? Think of justifying your sin. Just think about that practice, that moment, where you sin, and then you think of a reason about why it's right to sin. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I will as your pastor. I also do this. Think of that moment. The more you justify your sin, you need to hear the sentence, the more vague God becomes. The more you justify your sin, the more vague God becomes. Why? Because you enter into a relationship with God with this really clear picture of love and grace. I mean, we sing, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. All of us that have come to faith had that moment of clarity, and that is God loves me. And He gave His Son for me. And He wants to be in a relationship with me. I see it so clearly. And then this clear picture of love and mercy and grace changes into something really complex the more you justify your sin. And all of a sudden, God becomes this character that you need to understand and figure out instead of just being a person that you should experience being in a relationship with. Do you guys, did you guys realize that? God isn't meant to be understood. God is meant to be experienced. And the more we experience Him, the more we understand Him. But when you keep on justifying your sin and you try to find loopholes in your relationship with God, then He becomes this complex being that you need to understand. Cause and effect. How big is my sin? How big is the punishment? Is He going to punish me? He said He wouldn't, but I mean, <laughs> continuing in the sin, but I mean, it is good and it is justified, but I'm not quite sure. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sin and then I'm going to say sorry. And then you sin and then you say sorry and then you realize that hurts God, God's heart. And you're just caught in this web that's unsustainable. And then all of a sudden you're just not experiencing the Father's love anymore. Let, let me use a few examples. Think about money. Generosity and greed or selfishness, because those are opposites. You never need a reason to be generous, because it's a response to God's goodness. Have you ever thought about that? You never have to argue to generous people to give money, because they give money already as a response from God's goodness. But you always need a reason to be selfish, or to be stingy, or to be greedy. Think about this. I know that I should let this go, but I'm not. So what do I need now? I need a reason not to let this go. Okay, so now I need to argue for this. God's generosity and His abundance and His goodness that He's given me becomes really vague because now you're arguing against embodying it. Do you see how this happens? And the more you argue against what God wants you to do, the less you actually do what He wants you to do. And money is a biggie for us. And now all of a sudden, as you become more stingy and more selfish, God just isn't this abundant, gracious, loving God to you anymore. And now all of a sudden you see Him to be selfish and greedy and wanting the stuff you want for yourself. So God becomes coerced into your own needs. Do you see how quickly that happens? Just because you're walking in the darkness, but you say that you're not. So whoever you worship that says you don't need to be generous, that's not the God of the Bible. Think about sex. Teenagers, you need to hear this. Sex has a purpose and a place according to the Bible. It is a gift to be received at the right time and in the right place. And oh, what a glorious gift it is. I didn't look at Pam, I looked at my wife. Just saying, just saying, just saying. As you receive this gift, listen, you are participating in created order for the well-being and flourishing of mankind. And now you fall into sexual sin, and what happens? It's all about your needs and your desires. Gone is the gift, and gone is the purpose and the place. 
And now all of a sudden, as you fall into sexual sin and you want your own needs and desires met, then all of a sudden, whatever it is you have a gripe with, it's about your partner, it's about your uh, stage of life, it's about the kids, it's about a whole bunch of other things that leads us to justify taking sex or participating in it outside of its proper place. And when you do it, this gracious giver of gifts become really vague because you start believing that he doesn't want to give you what you want, so you do it your way. Do you see it? Think about identity and everything that's going on in our world and in the church that has to do with our identity. We live in a world that says, I can decide who I am. Okay, so the God who creates who predestines, who knows, who calls, who saves, who commissions, that God's gone. How do you stay in union with a God who created you, but who shouldn't tell you who you are? How? And then because you claimed autonomy in terms of deciding who I am and even what I am, then I've got this gripe with this God because He just shouldn't tell me. Think about sitting around a dinner table. What would it be like if I tell Ava, I love you so much, my daughter, and she says to me, I'm not your daughter. I can decide who I am. Yeah, okay, AVC, yeah. top job, dude. This relationship is going to go phenomenal. <laughs> you are my daughter. It's just how it is. That's the identity that's been given to you. And I mean, you were given to us by God anyway, right? Like we didn't take you off the shelf. That's who you are. God's essential holiness, listen, excludes man's unholiness. I've used this illustration before, but let me use it again. You know your trolley bin, right? Full of germ and muck and stink. You are not going to roll that bad boy into your bedroom. Why? Because they don't fit together. Because your bedroom is meant for something and the trolley bin is meant for something else and they can't coexist. <laughs> Just the thought of having our trolley bin in our room. <sighs> okay, so I haven't given you any good news yet. Because I want you to feel the weight of this. Look what it says. We are lying and not practicing the truth. Fam, conscience is a gift to help you to not fall into this trap. If your conscience speaks to you, listen. It is a gift given to us to help us walk in the light. So how do we walk in the light? With a clear conscience. First point. Second point, in community. Now let me just recap. The result of living in darkness is that it makes fellowship with God impossible. Why? Because human sinfulness inevitably interrupts a personal relationship between man and God. Recap. Everything I just said into one sentence. Now it says, if you look at verse 7, it says, If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light. If we walk, that word is a Greek word that is in the present tense. It literally means we are walking. Right? So as we are walking, it's a continuous attitude of mind. So living in the light implies, listen, a conscious and sustained mission to live a life in conformity with the revelation of God. Consistently, and sustained, I'm going to live in the light according to what God has revealed to me. Now, the next sentence, we have fellowship with one another. It's six words in English. It's four words in Greek. It's really difficult, okay? But stay with me. We're going to work through this. John writes positive consequences of living in the light after he spoke about the negative results of living in the darkness. Do you see it? Okay. Now, you might have expected that the first one would be, we share fellowship with God, right? Because if we walk in the light, 
and our sin is out of the way, then we'll experience fellowship with God. But instead of saying that, John moves on to say, to live in the light is to share fellowship with God's people. Okay. So why do we share fellowship with God's people as we walk in the light? Because that is how we walk in the light. Period. John doesn't explain it. He doesn't give us a reason why fellowship with God goes hand in hand with fellowship with God's people. He just says, that's how it is. So it's a given for John, this is important, that fellowship with God involves fellowship with His people. The reason why I used the table illustration earlier is because it works in this one as well. Like, how do you speak to only one end of the table? Is if everyone else is there. Think about it. Like I sit around the table, the Godhead and His people. Look God, I don't like your people. So I'll speak to you. It's going to be a phenomenal dinner for the rest of eternity. Uh, me and you, we good. How can you do that? That's exactly what John says. So whether you like God's people or not, we're all in the same circle. Think about that picture illustration in the beginning. So positive consequences of living in the light. One of them is fellowship with God's people. Now, there were people in John's church who claimed to have a relationship with God, but at the same time neglecting to love their fellow Christians. John says that can't be. Okay? Because we're all in the same circle. Now, let me just take a quick side road here. Our welcome team, the fact that we have a coffee station, Question of the day, city groups, men's, women, uh, men's uh, ministry, women's ministry. They all serve the purpose of creating a space where you can have fellowship with God's people. Do you see it? Nothing of our ministry is lackadaisical or haphazard or by chance. We create these spaces so that you can move into this profound mystery of experiencing fellowship with God and with His people at the same time, all around the same table. That's why we do what we do. And if you are never, listen, if you are never in any of these spaces or in spaces similar to it, you can't claim that you are okay with God. Because that's what people tell me. Look, dude, you don't have to worry. Me and the big guy upstairs, I think that's very disrespectful, because I don't think we can talk about God in that way, but that's what people tell me. We good. Yeah, okay. Top job. Let me tell you that you're not good. You're not. How was question of the day for you? I heard a sigh when Kuliso read it. Oof. I wanted it to be that way. Who knows you? Who knows you? Where can you say, I am not doing well? Where? And I know that we're a caring and loving church. But if your answer to the next three questions is the pastor, you are in trouble. Because I can't be everyone's best friend. Where can you say, I absolutely lost it yesterday? Where? Where can you say, I am addicted and I need help? Where? You will be able to walk in the light if you are in community. And if you are in community, you will have a space to say these things. What do you think? How are we doing here as a church? I thought about this. I would say we are scoring 50%. Meaning 50% of our church is in community. But 50% of our church is not. And the only thing that I can say to that is we are trusting God that He will grow this part of our ministry. We're not blind to it. It's not like we're not trying. But like, I can't, I can't make you love one another. Do you know what I mean? The Spirit needs to do that inside of you. Okay. It's been a heavy one. Let's end this sermon with some great news. So how do we walk in the light? With a clear conscience. We walk in the light in community. Third one. We walk in the light 
trusting in the gospel. Look at verse 7. Another result of living in the light follows from the first, right? So the first result was you have fellowship with God's people. Here's the second one. And the blood of Jesus purifies us or cleanses us from all sin. This is because fellowship with God immediately produces an awareness of God's holiness and man's unholiness or sin. Think about it. If you have real intimacy with the Father, one of the first things that happen to you is you just become aware of your own sin. It's just how it is. And John reassures us that God has anticipated this need. So, in the death and resurrection of Jesus exists the possibility of purification from every sin. Come on! Illustration. Have you ever seen your kid fall? Have you ever seen a kid fall if you don't have your own kids? As a parent, fam, you see it happening. And then time slows down. And before it even happens, your whole nerve center goes, my day, my day, boom, and you're out of the seat. You anticipate that the kid's going to fall. And what does a good parent do? You are right there, either to catch or to pick up, even if it's not your own kids. Does that resonate with anyone? Or is it only my kids that fall? Ever? Okay, ta. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. I really appreciate that. John says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now the term blood is a symbol for the crucifixion of Jesus, and its background comes from the Jewish sacrificial system. Quick side note, last year we preached a series called That's Great News. I preached a sermon on um, the perfect death, where I unpacked everything that you needed to know about Old Testament sacrifices and what atonement means. So I can't repeat all of that now. You can go and uh, check that on our channels. Here's what I will say, though. In the Old Testament, blood was regarded as the source of life. And in terms of a sacrifice, as a means of atonement, to make atonement between man and God, to bring man and God together again, the blood of an animal was thus its life that was given up in death. And then the sprinkling of that blood guaranteed the worshiper, the person who brought the sacrifice, the effectiveness of that sacrifice, right? So I have to pay for something, I did something wrong, this blood will pay for it, Whew, now I'm in the clear again. Now the blood of Jesus occupies a really important place in the New Testament, and it must be interpreted above the uh, specific background of the Day of Atonement, right? In terms of Jewish religion and Jewish sacrifice. So there was one day a year where the high priest would bring a sacrifice, and that sacrifice would be the... I, I did actually know how to write it in English, so I'm just going to read it to you. It had to be the most perfect possible sacrifice. Because it couldn't be the perfect sacrifice, but it also couldn't be like a half-baked sacrifice. So it had to be the, the most perfect possible sacrifice once a year, which could atone for everyone's sin for all year. Problem with that is, it had to be repeated. Now, here's the good news. Tune back in. In His suffering and death, this is what John says, Jesus, in perfect obedience, offered the true and lasting sacrifice for sin. True and lasting sacrifice for sin. So, to say here that the blood of Jesus purifies us from every sin means that in the cross of Christ, listen to this, our sin is, this is a rapper, effectively and repeatedly removed. Do you see it? Effectively and repeatedly removed. That word purifies, or in this um, translation, it's translated as cleanses. It is a present continuous verb, meaning it's happening now and it'll keep on happening forever. And ever, and ever, ever, forever, ever. <laughs> ever. It's only people who were teenagers in the early 2000s that would get that song. So how do we walk in the light? We trust in the gospel. 
again and again and again and again. Yes, you today, if you need to know that you are cleansed from all your sin, you can know that today and tomorrow and the following day forever. The sacrifice which cleanses us from every sin is described as, and this is important, Jesus, uh, the, blood of, the blood of Jesus, His Son. That was carefully chosen by John. Why? Because he says what he believes about Jesus, and he provides an answer to the views of those who were making, or were, who were inclined to make, false claims about Jesus. Do you remember I said earlier, we had the Jewish folk and the Greek folk? And both of them had a problem with Jesus. Now check this. Now John says, Jesus, his son. He says that so that those with too high a view of his person, meaning the people who said he couldn't be a human, he reminds them that he was genuinely a human. Why? Because he uses his earthly name. Jesus. Like he was a historical figure. Born. A human being. And then on the other hand, for those who say, uh, who, who had a view of Jesus that was too low, right, meaning that he couldn't be God, he recalls them to the truth that he was also God's own son. Why? So that he could pay the sacrifice, or so that he could offer the sacrifice perfectly. Do you see it? I mean, it's only three words, but it's so sharp from John. This is the one who shed his blood for us. Jesus, his son, who effectively and repeatedly removes our sins so that we can be cleansed, so that we can walk into the light. This Jesus in the Gospel of John, probably written by the same person, says, I am the good shepherd. Right? The one who brings life in abundance. The one who gives life life in abundance. I want to give you a warning, fam. This is where the enemy hits us the hardest. Can I remind you that the enemy, Satan, the source of evil in this world, is a thief. And what he does is he only steals, kills, and destroys. It's in the same passage where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He says, for the thief only comes to uh, steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief is not your friend. The devil can't be your buddy. He only steals. He is a liar. And here it is. Here's what he tells you. You won't get another chance. That's what he tells you. So every time we fall into sin, every time we do walk in the darkness, the enemy tells us, you won't get another chance. Or, check this, he tells us, it's not worth trying again. I know people that have given up on their Christian faith because they believe that lie. Now, if I was a very charismatic preacher, I would have now shouted, liar! But I'm not. He's lying. He's lying because the Bible tells us that Jesus effectively and repeatedly removes your sin. And he, today can be that day for you again. So how do we walk in the light? We walk in the light with a clear conscience. We walk in the light in community. And we walk in the light trusting in the gospel. I want you to think about your response today. Do you have a conscience that you need to deal with? Because if you do, deal with it now. You'll find grace, absolutely only grace. Are you convicted of the fact that you love God but you don't love His people? Are you one of those people that say, God and I are good, but you don't care about everyone at the rest of the table? Because if you do, you need to repent and you need to come and sit at the table and you need to speak to the very people that you don't like. Do you know that there are people around the table who also don't like you? That's really important. People tell me how messed up Christians are. 
Then I ask them if they've realized how messed up they are. <laughs> right? <laughs> those people are so annoying. Do you know that those people are pointing their fingers at you, telling them that you are annoying them? The church is full of annoying people, fam. <laughs> but God chose to put all of them around the table. So we need to love them. We can't be ninja Christians. Who float in and float out and no one ever knows or sees their faces. And lastly, do you need to believe the gospel again? Again. I mean, you, you might have to believe it for the first time. That's also possible. But do you have to trust the gospel again? Fam, there's nothing sweeter than confessing your sin and knowing that the blood of Jesus, His Son, human like I am, knows all my trials, but divine like God is, gracious and loving, cleanses us from all sin. There's nothing more satisfying than experiencing that. The best possible way that I always think about it is me approaching God Asking him to talk about my sin. And then he says to me, I don't know what you're talking about. It's all done. It's gone. We don't have to do it again. Just think about the freedom and the good news that comes with that. So whatever it is that you need to respond to, I want to pray for you. So let's pray. And then we're going to respond by singing that we have a good, good Father. Oh yes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for all of us that needs to obey our conscience. I pray that we would have the conviction that walking in the light is much better than walking in the darkness. That we would have the conviction that your holiness excludes our unholiness and our sin that we would have the conviction that we are headed down a path of death and theft and destruction, that we would have the conviction that having fellowship with you is far greater than anything we could ever experience. Father God, I pray for us who needs to plug into community, who believes the lie that we don't need fellowship. I pray for all of us who don't have a space in which we can say we're not alright, who don't have a space in which we can say that we are living in darkness. I pray that you would graciously give us the spaces and the, the relationships in this community where we can have that, embody it, and experience it. And I pray that you would take away all of our prejudices and all of our man-made boundaries that we erect between us and other people so that we can truly experience the wonder of being part of your transcultural church. And I pray for all of us, Lord Jesus, who needs a fresh outpouring of the good news today, who needs to experience the feeling of cleansing by your blood. I pray that you would wash us, every part of us, top to toe and everything in between. May we experience your grace. May we experience your love. May we experience the cleansing power, effective and repeatedly. Lord Jesus, I pray against the lie that we won't get another chance. I pray against the lie that it's not worth trying again. I pray that that lie will not keep our people captive, but that we will respond and that we will experience the wonder, the wonder of your amazing grace. Father God, we believe that you are a good Father, and we are going to respond now by telling ourselves that and by singing that aloud. May your name be worshipped as we respond to you now. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.